Hi guys, it is an absolutely gorgeous day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization in the Catskill Mountains. We are one half of the way through 2019 today. Unbelievably, we have made it to July 1st, 2019, and I cannot think of any better way to, so, to celebrate this milestone than having the great honor and pleasure of heading all the way over to Sydney, Australia, where I am going to uh, be interviewing and having a conversation with a gentleman whose name has been actually in the mainstream media news uh, recently, and this is Ian Dunlop. And for those of you not familiar with Ian Dunlop, he is an Australian engineer, writer, and energy expert with a particular interest in the interaction of corporate governance, corporate responsibility, and sustainability. He is currently an independent advisor on climate change and energy governance. Uh, it holds a, he, he's from Australia, holds a lot of offices down there, and most surprisingly, and we're going to talk about this here in the very beginning, previously, Ian Dunlop worked in oil, gas, and coal exploration and production uh, in scenario and long-term energy planning. He was a senior executive of Royal Dutch Shell, for many years and CEO of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. He even chaired the Australian Coal Association. Uh, so I, I must admit, I, Ian Dunlop, I, I have never read that resume on anyone I have ever interviewed on this channel, but I want you to come on board, Ian Dunlop, and say hi to the folks and we are going to dive right into this. Hi Sam, well thanks very much for uh, having me on your program, much appreciated and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Okay, well, let, let's do spend a few minutes, Ian. I, I have to admit when, when people were first uh, recommending that you are a man, I really needed to talk to you. I know that I am not the only one a little bit confused. How does a former senior executive of Royal Dutch Shell and the chairman of the Australian Coal Association become one of the biggest. Uh, well, I don't want. I, I'm not. I'm not going to use the word alarmist. Although I don't. I don't find that a pejorative term. How did you go from Royal Dutch Shell to becoming a climate change policy advocate and activist? Uh, tell us about that. Well, it's not really a road to Damascus conversion, Sam. Um, I started my career in the oil industry in the early 60s. And uh, at that time, I was involved in a lot of long-term energy planning work. And um, even then, there were discussions around the idea of climate change eventually becoming a problem for the fossil fuel industry. It's not, not in an immediate any sense of immediate emergency, but sooner or later, as things developed, we would reach the point where the impact of carbon emissions began to have an influence on global uh, climate. Now, as the years have gone by, the science has got clearer and clearer, the evidence has got clearer and clearer, and there comes a point uh, at a certain stage where you really have to start to do something about it. Now for me, um, I, I worked in oil and gas exploration in the 60s and 70s. I came to Australia in um, the end of the 70s to set up a coal business here, actually, as a bridge to the future, as it was seen then after the first oil shock in 1973, 74 and onwards. And I chaired the, um, I was involved in coal operations here in Australia through the 80s. I chaired the Coal Association association here at the end of that time and it became clear I guess to me that um, you know by the end of the 80s Jim Hansen was making testimony to Congress on the realities of climate change the UN was starting to get into gear on addressing the problem 
And by the end of the 80s, I'd reached the stage of saying, well, look, we really now need to do something about this because it is going to become a major issue for our future. So I got out of the fossil fuel business in the very early 90s, and I've spent a lot of time ever since, and almost entirely since um, the year 2000, uh, focused on, I guess, trying to reverse the direction uh, I've been coming in for the first half of my career and trying to get people to seriously address climate change. So that's the background. Okay, well, well, well welcome to this side of the, the, the fancy. And, and, and real quickly, since we're going to be the, the heart of this conversation is going to be about uh, two papers that you and co-author David Spratt, who I hope to get on the show at some point, have written for an outfit called the Breakthrough Institute. Uh, just real quickly, just, just to give us some frame of reference, who is the Breakthrough Institute? Well, Breakthrough is a small organization uh, which uh, comprises uh, the director, Luke Taylor, and David Spratt, myself, and about uh, four or five other people who are very concerned that we need to reframe the conversation we've been having here in Australia, which has been pretty negative toward climate change, as you probably know, uh, to really focus on the fact that this country is going to have to fundamentally change its approach if we want to have a sustainable future. So we've, we've been focused very much on the what we see as the realities of the risk of climate change as opposed to the, uh, the science. I mean, we're working really at the interface of the science and the community and the corporate world in trying to get the risk implications clearly understood because we don't find that many people are actually operating or talking sensibly in that space. We have a lot of scientific discussion going on uh, which is extremely important and, and very valuable, obviously, to um, our future direction. But what we find missing is that the implications of that in terms of risk and uncertainty are not discussed anywhere near enough. So that's really what Breakthrough does, is to focus on that uh, <coughs> vacuum, if you like, around risk and uncertainty in this entire arena. Okay, so... You have been, you know, I've been following your work for for quite a while, uh, and I admit I was a little bit surprised at how this latest paper with the title "Existential Climate Related Security Risk: A Scenario Approach," which sounded to me like pretty much what you have been saying, and I've been cheering you on for. For several years, it, it sounded like just your latest, uh, your, your latest message. So, but it seemed to somehow it found its way into the mainstream media. This this is this a short twelve page paper, guys? And I'm going to put the link to this paper and the larger paper we're going to be talking more about. And you need to read these two papers. But I guess what it was, do you agree, Ian, that, that what got the attention of so many people outside of, of this narrow rabbit hole who probably would not have been so surprised by anything in this was that you actually spelled out what it could look like on this planet in 30 years from now, that you went to 2050 and basically said, guys, it is not out of bounds to uh, that this scenario will unfold. So tell us about the 2050 scenario you talk about and why you got such a reaction to that. Okay, well, just to perhaps go back a little bit, um, David Spratt and I have been working together since about 2006. And if you pull together the science which was being published at that point in time, it was pretty clear that we had a much bigger problem on our hands than was being acknowledged officially, either by the UN uh, or by governments, and indeed by the IPCC itself. David Spratt and a colleague of his, Philip Sutton, uh, published a book called Climate Code Red in 2007. 
which pull all that together and said, look, <clears throat> what we're really facing here is a potential emergency that if we don't start to move far faster than was being proposed at that time, we're not going to be able to get on top of the climate problem. Now, what we've uh, done in the intervening period is continue to focus on these issues. And the science, of course, has got um, clearer and clearer, as I said earlier. Uh, we've seen mounting evidence that the, the, the science in many respects has been continually underestimating the speed at which climate change is actually happening um, and the extent of it, um, that sort of impact in that context. So we've been focused on this uh, whole issue that um, the real implications are being downplayed. Now, a lot of this debate hinges around arguments on how we handle the problem in terms of economics and technology. Essentially, uh, you know, whether we should price carbon, whether we should have emissions trading systems, whether we use market-based solutions as opposed to regulation and so on. That in this country, and I think it's true in the US from what I understand, uh, became an extremely toxic debate and it ended up focused for years on just the minutiae of those uh, economic issues. And what was being missed, I think, was the overall major risk to the future of uh, civilization as we know it. We tried to raise that debate into the national security arena about uh, three or four years ago because we uh, really found it extremely hard to get any traction at all um, in talking about sensible solutions in economic terms and started to focus on the fact that I mean, this would have much broader implications than anything uh, we were being told through official channels. So the two reports you referred to, the first one uh, we published in September of 2018 called What Lies Beneath, really looked at pulling together the um, science and the what we saw as the uh, reluctance by many in the scientific community to come out with the full implications of that. So it's called What Lies Beneath uh, the Understatement of Existential Climate Risk. Which is the, lar yeah, the larger 40... That's the larger report, paper. yeah. Now, that uh, goes into some detail about the um, all of the various arenas and the uh, tipping point issues, such as um, you know the Arctic, um, cyrosphere changes, uh, sea level rise, and so on and so forth. The the key point in all of this is that what is being missed is that whilst we talk in terms of uh, in in terms of climate modelling on you know temperature increase or increased rainfall events and so on and so forth. The big thing that isn't discussed are what we term the fact sale risks in the probability distribution of impact of climate change, which are the potential tipping points where you know, climate change is not something that's going to just increase in a linear sense as temperature rises, but you're going to reach points where um, certain parts of the climate system suddenly tip from one relatively stable state into another one which is far less conducive to human development. Um, the Arctic uh, at the moment is a classic example of that, uh, where the sea ice is sort of melting at rates that we've never seen before. The West Antarctic ice sheet um, <coughs> essentially has is, is almost reached a tipping point, if not past it. Um, and these, these are the big risks that we face. now. If you Explain look at this analysis. term, uh, since, since uh, unfortunately the the way my podcasts are are, are done, I, I'm not going to be able to show a bell curve. So so folks, just, just imagine a bell curve, and I want Ian to explain what a fat tail probability uh, on a bell curve is. It's, it's it's the right hand side of the bell curve. As, so just explain to us trying to imagine looking at a bell curve in our minds, the part of the bell curve you are looking at 
that's not in the fat of the bell curve, but off to the right. Yeah, well, the bell curve is typically symmetrical around a mean, and you have the two two sides, the range of possibilities. But in the with the tipping point issues I'm talking about, uh, what you find is the right hand side of the bell curve, the more extreme potential results, is disproportionately long. And so you get this distorted effect where the, the right-hand side pushes out uh, quite a considerable distance. Now, I mean, these are the, these are the so-called um, high-impact but low-probability events that might occur. The worst, case, the worst case scenario possibilities as, as opposed to the thick of the bell curve, which is the mo which sometimes might be thought of as the most likely that, and that's what the climate scientists tend to focus on, is the thick of the bell curve, I think is what you're saying. Yeah. They're looking at the probabilities and you're saying, well, you can't chop off the right fat tail of this bell curve because therein lies the possibility of the worst case scenario. Is that, am I understanding this or maybe you can explain that better than I just did? No, no that's, that's pretty right. I mean, what, what we're saying is that the, in the context of uh, potential events that could lead to the destruction of human civilization as we know it, then you really have to look very hard at those potential events. And depending on the, the way in which, uh, how serious you view the outcomes, you really have to focus on ensuring that those things don't occur. Because if they do, then we actually completely destroy what we've built up over, over hundreds of years in terms of civilization. Humanity may survive in some form, but civilization as we know it probably won't. So those are the sorts of things you have to think about. And the problem we have is that if you look at the work that's done by the IPCC, for example, on which uh, pretty much all official policy is based, those tipping points, the fat tails in the right-hand side of the probability distribution, are not quantified because uh, often for very good reasons that we don't know enough about it as yet, um, and therefore we can't put you know, hard numbers on. But that's not the point. I mean, the point is that if these things are, are likely, which the IPCC talk about in qualitative terms, or even, you know, relatively small possibilities, then we really should be considering those as an absolute priority and setting in place uh, policies that ensure they don't happen. I mean, the whole point of sensible risk management is to stop things happening you know, before they actually materialize. And we know that uh, a number of those tipping points are now developing in ways which will become irreversible once we cross those, um, in those thresholds. And therefore, we have to take action before that occurs. But so your so, concern is that, uh, that, that a lot of the science community, and probably more important, the political community, that the scientific community is advising what they call these policy makers by ignoring the, 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 by chopping off that little, we don't want to talk about the right side of the uh, bell curve that they're chopping off the biggest threats to, uh, to civilization and they're throwing out the uh, baby with that bathwater. Exactly. And, That's the whole point. And, and therefore, we need a conversation that is prepared to honestly acknowledge that these are um, risks we now face and we have to adopt a different sort of risk management in handling them if the implications are as severe as we think they may well be, which is that you know, human you know, civilization as we know it is completely destroyed. I mean, the, this is not new stuff. I mean, these, these concerns have been around for 10 or 15 years or more uh, in the community, the small community of people who have been looking seriously at them. So it's not as if we've suddenly discovered something new, but the, uh, you made the point, I think, you know, the, the science is essentially put forward in the IPCC framework, the um, 
UNF, you know, UNF uh, framework convention on climate change. That science is based on the peer-reviewed papers that have been published in the sort of uh, preceding six, uh, seven years or so. And the conclusions that come out of that work are then put forward for political consideration. And our view has been that a lot of this uh, work that's done is then damped down by the politicians, particularly in the summary material. So that what is then finally issued is really a very um, moderated and, and damped down version of reality. And that's what we then base uh, you know, our climate policy developments on. Now, you know, I've been involved in high-risk ventures uh, for a large part of my career. And the one thing you learn very early in the piece is that if you've got a major problem, you have to be brutally frank about what the scale of that problem really is. You have to define it very clearly. Well, define it very clearly. Be brutally frank with us, uh, Ian, uh, and, and define clearly what you're talking about when you're talking about an existential risk to uh, global industrial society over the next 30 years. What's it going to look like? Could it look well, like? That's what, you, that's what you have to really think about, and you have to be prepared to put that in front of people and argue the case as to why we need to set up policy frameworks that can address it. Now, if you, if you damp down the um, issue in the first place, in other words, you're not honest about the scale of the problem, then you end up with policies that will not solve it. And that's what we've seen for the last 30 years. I mean, you know, the, the frameworks that have been talked about in Paris, for example, are completely inadequate for the changes that are going to have to be made. And we're not even coming anywhere near achieving what was agreed in Paris. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're living in a fool's paradise. And I think it's time we stopped playing games and started to honestly talk about the scale of the problem we've got. Not in the, I mean, it is time for a bit of alarmism, frankly, but this is not alarmism. It's just sensible risk management, given that we face a potential existential threat. And, and if the threat is existential, which means that we may destroy the, the civilization we've created over the last several hundred years, then you need a different sort of risk management. You firstly say, well, this is the problem, honestly. We're here today. We have to get somewhere else tomorrow. How do we do it? No arguments about what's politically realistic and so on. We just have to accept that that's the change that has to be made. I mean, that may seem idealistic, given the nonsense that's flying around politically on these things. But unless we start that sort of a conversation, then we don't have a hope of uh, basically getting on top of the issue. Well, well, and I think, you see, that's what, that's what I think is coming through to school children, to all of the concerns that people now have uh, on emergency responses and so on. Because I don't think um, people are just going to sit there like rabbits in the headlight and get run over by the climate truck. I mean, they're not going to be prepared to do that. So they're going to take action, and we're starting to see that happen now. All right, so um, w w once again, let's try to get... Let I want to get clear on what your vision is, one, one of the possible scenarios that you think uh, too many people are ignoring. Get, give us a taste of life on, on Earth in 30 years uh, that you talked about in your scenario okay. approach that, uh, that, got, that got some people's attention, and then we'll talk about their reaction to that. Okay, well, if you look at the way a lot of this is presented, we get um, a lot of modeling, modeling results from scientific work and the IPCC have done a lot of it recently, of course, last year in their 1.5 degree C um, analysis, which basically sets out um, probabilities on what they think temperature ranges will be at a certain point in time, 2100 or 2050, uh, what's going to happen to other extreme events, rainfall and so on. The trouble is that a lot of that is very theoretical. And it's very hard to understand in many senses for the layman, you know, what all those probability figures actually mean. So what we try to do is to say, well, if you take the um, information we currently got and the path we're currently on, 
let's just assume that the, the commitments that were made in Paris in 2015 are actually implemented, then we'd be heading for a world which will probably be a temperature increase of around three to three and a half degrees C. Um, and that may occur somewhere anywhere from 2050 onwards, uh, given the rate at which things are changing. So we just said, well, if you take the best information we've got, what, what would that world look like? Not in terms of probabilities and stuff, but in hard-nosed practical impact on the ground. So the sort of things that we came up with in terms of impact is that the, we would see ecosystem collapses in coral reefs, uh, which is already happening if you look at the Great Barrier Reef in Australia and many other parts of the world. The Amazon rainforest um, and the Antarctic sea ice and ecosystems. You would see areas of the world where deadly heat beyond the ability of human physiology to function occurred for over 100 days per annum in many regions with extreme flooding in, in others and so on. You see sea level rise by uh, possibly around half a metre. Many areas and regions would become uninhabitable, particularly areas like the Middle East and so on, um, parts of the Sahel and Africa, Africa, parts of Northern Australia possibly. We would see um, a major drop in crop yields and food production. The lower reaches of major rivers in, in Southeast Asia, for example, like the Mekong, the Ganges uh, and the Nile in the Mediterranean uh, would become inundated as sea, with sea level rise. You'd see significant sectors of major cities abandoned, places like Chennai, Mumbai in India, Jakarta in Indonesia, Guangzhou, Tianjin, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Manila, Bangkok and Lagos in Africa. Um, the result of all of this would be some, somewhere around a billion people displaced, either internally within countries or possibly uh, between countries. And the uh, picture that was painted in one of the papers last year that um, Will Stephan and John Schellenhuber and others produced, the, uh, the Hot House Earth paper, those sort of irreversible changes would start to be triggered. I mean, this is, this is a view which is, um, some would argue, is at the high end of, uh, you know, the possible um, uh, outcomes of climate change. But it's not um, an improbable one at all. I mean, this is within the bounds of the sensible discussion that's been going on of people looking seriously at this. You can view it as, um, you know, extreme. Um, but if you look at the, the full amount of material that's around on these things, um, it's not really so. I mean, this is quite a feasible proposition in our view. So now, some so scientists have disagreed with that and others have, uh, have uh, agreed with it. You're going to get a difference of opinion. But the point, quite simply, is you need to start talking about this stuff because uh, these are the risks we face. Well, the scenarios you just painted, I mean... Uh, of course, I'm down here in this rabbit hole. I, I'm down here deep, so I, I don't even think you're at the farthest uh, right reach of the bell curve. So let's say what you just described, I don't know, has somewhere between a 5 and 10% chance of happening. And I like how you, how you phrased it in, in your paper that are you going to get on an airplane that has a 5 to 10 percent chance of crashing before you reach your destination? Of course not. But by accepting, by just shrugging off uh, the, the, that scenario you just read out, even if it is just a five to two, yeah, I, li I like the way you did that. So talk about that, that this whole notion of being branded an alarmist and we shouldn't listen to these alarmists. They're just cherry picking, uh, you know, the most extreme data. Just talk about people who try to shrug you and, and other people sharing your views off by using that term alarmist and getting people not to listen to you? Yeah, well, if you look at the Paris Agreement, I mean, we, in that agreement, what we, the countries, 195 countries who've signed it, 
agreed to do was to limit temperature to below 2 degrees C and as far as possible toward 1.5 degrees C. Now, I mean, the IPCC analysis that came out last year in looking at the ways of getting to 1.5 produced a lot of pictures that said, look, um, you know, we've got a chance, of, we, the chances of staying below 1.5 were premised on the fact that we had a 50-50 chance of achieving that. And on the two degrees analysis they did, it was based on a two-thirds chance, 66% chance of meeting the target. I mean, what we're talking about here is the future of uh, human civilization. Now, you know, as you just said, I mean, you wouldn't get on a plane to fly to New York on the basis you, you only had a 50-50 chance of getting there. You don't build bridges as an engineer with a 50-50 chance of them falling down. Um, if, you, if you were to take what I would regard as um, you know, a more sensible approach to it and saying, well, it, you need a 90% chance, um, and even that's not particularly good odds. I mean, for you know any any normal engineering thing, um, you actually have no what they call the carbon budget left today. Now that means if you want to achieve even two degrees C, you should not be putting any more carbon into the atmosphere as from today. I mean, clearly that's not going to happen because we're addicted to fossil fuels. We have to wean ourselves off them. But it indicates the, the unreality of the, the sort of work that's currently going on. Now, um, if, you, if you then add in the tipping point issues that I've talked about earlier, uh, which are not quantified at all, then, of course, we have a, you know, a completely different situation. So um, it means that the way in which you look at risk has to be completely changed. Now, coming back to the alarmist point, uh, the biggest problem I think we faced in the climate debate over the last 20 years is that people have not been prepared to discuss these sorts of realities. They uh, come from the point of view of saying, well, you've got to have positive stories. You can't scare the horses psychologically. Uh, you really got to tell people the way forward and what uh, we can do to get out of this hole and so on and so forth. And you certainly don't go and... Um, you know, overemphasize the these sort of realities. Now, I mean, in my view, that's completely wrong. You actually have to be brutally frank about the problem, as I said before, and you then can start to build sensible solutions. Now, whether you call that alarmism or not, I don't know. I mean, at this stage, having having spent 30 years on this challenge, it's been studied probably more than any other single issue in human history. Uh, we have achieved, in, if you're brutally frank, precisely nothing in terms of the hard-nosed outcomes. I mean, emissions, global carbon emissions are still rising at worst-case scenario rates. Um, we're not, we're seeing temperature increasing, um, you know, at uh, worst-case conditions and so on and so forth. So you have to now say, well, we do need a bit of alarmism and you need an honest discussion on how we're going to handle this problem. You need to really rethink the way um, humanity is going to operate if we're going to survive in a world that is beset by these sort of changes. And it's not just climate. I mean, it, it, uh, it touches on all the things you raised uh, earlier on in terms of planetary boundaries and so on, the, the limits to growth analysis the Club of Rome did years ago, uh, and so on. So. You need to start a different conversation. And really that's what we've been about, is to take a scenario that says, look, these are the hard most practical implications of what's going on. Uh, these are the sort of things we're going to be faced with. And I think that the, the reason it got picked up is that there's not been very much of that occurring. I mean, we've had these sort of very theoretical approaches um, to the way in which we look at climate. Uh, which tend to go over people's heads. But once you start talking about hard-nosed impact on cities being abandoned and so on, it brings it back to reality a little bit. So I don't apologise for any of that. I mean, I think we need that conversation. Sure, we can debate whether we're being, you know, a bit too uh, on the extreme side or otherwise. But uh, the important thing is to start that conversation. That, that's that's what we're doing uh, right right here right now 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 of course as as I 
often get thrown at me as I'm sure you do. We, we really appreciate the work you're doing, but you realize you're only preaching to the choir. And, and at <laughs> this point, particularly on, on this subject of climate change, and, and I've heard it here on my own channel in comments today, that people's minds are, at this point, people have made up their minds. And it's just, and they're just digging in their heels. They're, they, they have found their position on, on their belief. Uh, and that's what it is, their belief. And, and you're not going to be able to move them. If, if, if they agree with you, there's nothing, you know what I'm saying. If they don't agree with you, there's nothing you're going to be able to say that you're going to be able to verbalize in. That that's going to get anyone off their mark that they're in. It's going to take some real world two by fours hitting them over the head. What do you have to say about the whole preaching to the choir uh, attempt we're all making down here, you and I and other people? Well, I I think we are starting to see uh, quite a change occurring. I mean, we've been faced. Well, firstly, I think in a political sense, politicians, to me, will never lead on this issue because it's too too complex. I mean, our, our Western democratic systems, if you can call them that, uh, have basically got themselves to the point where they cannot consider long-term issues seriously because uh, everything is now predicated on the short-term approach to life. Uh, whether that be in a political sense or corporate uh, corporate context, and we can talk about why that's so, but uh, I think that's where we've got to. So something uh, else has to change. Now, what I think is altering is that um, we're now, because of a combination, I think, of the extreme events that are occurring around the world, uh, we're now starting to see that the big investment groups uh, particularly long-term superannuation funds and things of that kind, now realize that if they don't start to address climate seriously, they don't have a future. And they have uh, responsibilities to their membership to ensure investment returns you know, 20 or 30 years into the future. Those groups are starting to put a lot of pressure on the major corporate operators, um, particularly in the fossil fuel industry. Most of uh, the regulatory framework around the world is now starting to pick up on the fact that this potentially is a bigger risk, far bigger risk than anything we saw in the financial crisis in 2008. And are now putting pressure on the share markets around the world to start to disclose the climate risks that companies are faced with. So investment investors can see what the potential implications are going to be. That's all stuff that again begun to develop really only in the last two years. Uh, far too late, but at least it's a big step forward in many respects. In the meantime, the big fossil fuel companies are still, I think, sitting there thinking they can get away with um, not changing anywhere near fast enough that you, you get continual stories that you know fossil fuels will be there forever and a day. We have to have them to <clears throat> alleviate poverty in the developing world and so on and so forth. The, on the other side of the equation, technological innovation is obviously moving very quickly in terms of renewable um, technologies, efficiency improvements, cost reductions, all of which is good. But it's nowhere near the sort of scale we need to actually address this problem. I mean, if you look at the last 10 years, in terms of the investment in energy, the vast bulk of it is still going into fossil fuels. And despite all the hype about renewables and so on, it's still a relatively small proportion. Now, you know, we're not going to solve this problem if that goes on in that way. So there needs to be a coming together of uh, all of those concerns to recognize that even for the fossil fuel companies, they actually don't have a future unless we start to solve climate seriously, because they won't have markets. And if you look at our scenario, for example, even by 2050, a lot of their markets are going to be gone. I mean, people cannot you know, continue uh, in developing their economies uh, in the circumstances that we outlined. <clears throat> 
in a way that will continue to require all that fossil fuel. Well, dead people can't fill up their cars with gas, but anyway, that was my comment. That was my comment, not yours. But let's look at the the political reality, or I guess I should say unreality. You know, uh, we have Donald Trump, of course. Uh, good Lord, we know where that where, where what that looks like, and. I don't see anyone going up against him really next year. We have this new this new character there in Brazil, that Bolsonaro guy, and now I think wasn't it what wasn't it Ian? Was it the very week that you released existential climate related security risk uh, to an Australian audience that the Australian voters? Uh, just just pretty much sold out Australia uh, to the in, in the the fossil fuel uh, executives that you used to be part of. I'm sure the Australian Coal Association was having an absolute party on election day in in Australia. How wasn't that the same week that this paper came out? Well, it was a week or two before that, actually, but uh, you're right. I mean, you know, Australia voted to uh, stick with the status quo, basically, for, well, a whole host of reasons. I think it was a rather more complicated than just, um, uh, you know, the climate issue. Um, there was a lot of uh, other policy uh, issues involved in the, the way that the opposition Labour Party put forward their election campaign, which in many ways, I think, scared people off. And again, I mean, the Labour Party itself was not, um, did not really come clean on its intentions on climate. So it's a very confused picture. But nonetheless, the outcome is that if we stuck with the status quo of favouring uh, continual development of the, of the coal industry. That's perfectly true. Yeah, well, it wasn't even the, the status quo almost. It, it was almost like backsliding the, the way I but, was reading it. You know, it's backsliding in the sense that what the government is proposing is to open up a major new coal basin in, uh, in <laughs> Queensland um, at a time when coal is about to disappear off the scene, uh, which is a, a rather stupid policy from an Australian uh, Australian point of view in general. But that's, uh, that's where the debate still sits. However, um, what you're, 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 I think you're starting to see is increasing resistance to that from the community. And I think to answer your question on politics generally around the world, I'm, that is what's going to happen. I mean, as I said before, uh, people can now see the potential impact of climate, the, even in the big investment houses of the world. The, um, you know, the, these events are, are intensifying. And they're not going to just sit there and look at it and say, we're going to accept, uh, you know, what our political masters are telling us. I mean, if you look at the latest um, G20 meeting in Osaka in Japan last uh, weekend, I mean, it's complete nonsense. Um, you know, the G20 in theory is committed to serious action on climate change. They very nearly had no reference to climate change in the final communique. As it sits, it's the last item on the agenda and uh, a lot of platitudes, but no real, um, you know, solid commitment to moving forward because of the disparate views of the various members, uh, not least the separate clause for the United States. Yep. So on the fact that it disadvantages American workers and taxpayers, well, they're going to get a lot more disadvantaged by the impact of climate change because... I would have thought that in the U.S. you're seeing some of the more extreme uh, climate impacts right now. So, uh, well, in, in the, while that was going on at G20, I think in the first, e even the Democratic debates in Miami, while Miami is, is just sweltering in this heat stroke, seven minutes seven minutes uh, of the the democratic debates not even which is probably six and a half minutes more than would have been if it if there had been a republican debate but of course there's not going to be a republican debate because we have donald trump uh heading that one i i mean so even you know people down here understand that even if a democrat uh 
quote, wins. When, when you look at how seriously the issue is being paid over there, that, that anyone who thinks a Democratic Party victory in the U.S. is going to rise to the challenge uh, you, you know, they're, they're crazy. So what, I mean, what is your level of optimism that e even if we do have the technical ability to do this, which, which is a big if, I just see no evidence, Ian, uh, of any sort of will. Uh, I, I mean, that, that, that really is relative to the size of what, and, and I'm talking about my own consumer and life. I'm talking from individual consumer and lifestyle choices right on up that nobody is willing to take this seriously and make the sacrifices and whatnot. Uh, just what, what is your level of optimism that we are going to be able to turn this freight train around at this point? Well, it's a massive challenge, obviously, and we may not succeed in doing it. I mean, humanity may take the view that it's all too hard and we just let it go and uh, take what comes. And what does that um, mean? Now, I mean, on the other hand, I think we're starting to see, as I said, um, very big attitudinal changes occur. Uh, it will require an enormous push from the community to really f force that into concrete action. And uh, I think, you know, that's beginning to build. But obviously, it's going to be uh, a, a race against time. I mean, uh, we will probably go to the last possible minute. And we may pull off some sort of, uh, you know, massive change, but we may well not. You can take a fairly pessimistic view at this point in time. But I think uh, really what one has to adopt is the attitude that you do everything you possibly can to force that change. And we need a different sort of leadership emerging. I mean, we need a you know, sort of all-encompassing commitment across individual societies to recognize this sort of challenge and get in behind making it happen uh, as, you, as you do in a wartime situation. I mean, I don't particularly like the war analogy, but that is the sort of thing that has to occur. We've done it before, I mean, in, in, in war context. Well, what's your picture of that? I, I, I'm hearing this term. Uh, I mean, I've been, it really came to the forefront with uh, last fall's IPCC thing. I, I, I'm hearing this new Marshall Plan, this World War II effort. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing the jingo, yep. but, but I'm not hearing. So, so, so spend a few minutes spelling out what is your wartime plan to get people to take this seriously and, and rise to the challenge as Mother Nature is going full steam ahead. Uh, give us your your blueprint for a world war uh, resistance to this. Well, firstly, politics won't lead it. Um, right and left wing politics and the way we talk about it become irrelevant in this situation. I mean, what happens in, in a war, war context is that you recognize that there is a major threat that is genuinely existential. In other words, it can destroy you. And you see that as a priority which is higher than anything else which has to be addressed. That means you have to get the, the best possible leaders together uh, in a context to address that threat with the best advice they can possibly get. You need a sort of all-encompassing commitment across society, recognizing that this is in everybody's interest to come together to really uh, solve this problem. And uh, that, that will require completely different governance arrangements from the ones we're accustomed to. And it may work uh, in some of our democratic frameworks, but it may well not. Um, and that raises questions about where do you go? I mean, do you end up in an authoritarian system of some kind, which is not ideal either. Uh, but it, it is now something that is going to have to be seriously discussed as to what sort of framework you work in. I mean, in a government con in a in a wartime context, you've had things like so-called governments of national unity, where you set aside business as usual, whether it be politically, corporately, or socially in recognition that that is the threat you now have to address.
Now, I think we will reach the point where we have to take that position. Um, whether we can do it in time and whether within the constraints we've got within the system, uh, it's possible, I think, is, a, is a, obviously a, an open question. And if you, if you look at where we are today, you perhaps uh, will not be very encouraged that we can actually achieve it. But the fact is, that's what we have to do. We're in the last so, fat tail of the bell curve is the way I'm looking at it. I think we've moved, I think we've moved the conversation from the right fat tail to the left fat tail. I mean, that, that's just, that's just mine, but that, but this, this is, uh, I'm not, I'm not interviewing myself. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm talking to you and, and all in, what did you say a minute ago, Ian, an all encompassing, all encompassing social effort. Uh, I um, don't see it well, in the Catskill Mountains in New York today. Well, you're, you're no doubt you're right, but the fact is that uh, this will be something which will be a last-minute exercise. We'll get right to the edge of the cliff before we probably decide to do anything. The question is whether we can put it all together in that time. What I said was an all-encompassing commitment across society where business as usual is suspended whether it be politically, corporately, or uh, socially. I mean, left and right politics become irrelevant, frankly. And uh, in, in the recognition that it's in everybody's interest, interest to solve this, we then do see a coming together which enables you to do things that you previously thought were impossible. I mean, that's the famous phrase that Milton Friedman said a long time ago, I think. You know, our role in life is to... Uh, prepare the plans for the days when the uh, politically impossible becomes inevitable. And that's what we're about. So we have to really think through how the hell you're going to do this, what does need to be done. And that's a lot of what our, our work is aimed at. Um, and try and encourage that um, development uh, to happen as soon as we possibly can. Not an easy task, I, uh, I agree, and uh, many of you may think it's hugely idealistic and totally unrealistic. But then you say, well, what else do you do? Because this stuff is not going away. I mean, it's, it's there, it's happening, uh, all of the denialists in the world will not change it. So um, that's a, somehow the framework that we have to sort of build uh, responses around. Okay, well, that's so we're 52 minutes into this, so I really only got time for a couple of more quick, quick points to make. Get this back to the individual. I always like to say, okay, so you're a person listening to this conversation thinking, what can I do? What is your advice to the average person? What can the average person do in their puny little individual consumer and lifestyle choices at this point to, uh, to make a difference? Well, I think nothing really big ever happens for that a small number of people really pick up, picking up on it to start with. I think what individuals can be doing is, is getting themselves well informed on the realities we now face. Um, you know, however un un unsavory they may, may be, but really understanding that, then using every possible means they have to encourage their sort of fellow citizens to get into that space as well, uh, to address the uh, institutional frameworks within which they're around the, the, where they're living and so on, whether it be parliamentary members, um, uh, community members, local councils, governments, whatever, and encourage this sort of discussion to um, continually be taken up. And I think then you're going to be increasing protest movements which uh, refuse to affect, accept the fact that the incumbency can continue to do what it's currently doing, which is basically to ignore the problem. So, you know, wherever we have opportunities to build that, um, we should be encouraging individuals to get into it and do it. I mean, in a leadership sense, we need uh, leaders to emerge from all of the elements of society to start to take this seriously. And you, you are starting to see them come forward. I mean, uh, we haven't really talked about, you know, a lot of the constraints on the existing system, but, you know, one of the biggest problems in the corporate world is the way we actually pay people. And... Uh, the very short-term nature of um, remuneration in 
say, the certainly in the Western democracies, and particularly in the US and Australia and Canada and the UK, means a lot of people have really not seen it in their own self-interest to do anything about this. But uh, and that, no, you know, those problems continue. But I mean, on the other hand, they've all got children. They presumably have some interest in their children's future. And it does start to come down to those sort of ethical and moral issues now increasingly because it's pretty obvious that the uh, existing system is not going to respond unless it's really uh, given a hell of a stimulus to change. And that stimulus has, can come from inside as well as from outside. Okay, well, we are going to have a collapse of global industrial civilization here in four and a half minutes on this camera. So as I do with all of my guests, Ian Dunlop, if you were not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles, where you had an hour to go, but you had 60-second soundbite to the mainstream media on the first day of the second half of 2019, what would your 60-second message to humanity sound like, Ian Dunlop? Start to wake up to the really critical issues that the global community and various national communities are facing. And in the media context, start to talk about it honestly on the grounds that it now represents your future and not just the future of some uh, theoretical scientific beast uh, that we really don't understand and don't want to know about. You have to start to address reality and stop pushing it under the carpet. Okay, and with with that, that was an excellent summation. Now, I want you to stick around just for a minute after we wrap this up. But guys, as obviously I could uh, go on with this man f forever but I strongly suggest you go on to these two links to these papers from the Breakthrough Institute and you can find more of Ian Dunlop and David Spratt's work on the Breakthrough Institute website which I'll put on here but Ian Dunlop I just want to say thank you very much for taking one hour out of your busy schedule to come visit us on Collapse Chronicles and more importantly there are some of us who really do appreciate the work, the hard, sometimes thankless task uh, that that you are, that you are up to and up against, and we really appreciate what you're doing for civilization and the planet. And keep up the good fight, Ian Dunlop. Okay, well, thanks very much, Sam, for having me on, and uh, much appreciate the conversation. All right, and that wraps it up for this week. Bye, guys.